This video will demonstrate why every rational person must accept evolution. I'd like to begin by demonstrating the concept of independent verification. It's the idea that when evaluating something, it's more likely to be true if multiple methods using completely independent mechanisms or data arrive at the same conclusion. Let's say there's a famous historical tree I want to know the age of. I use carbon dating and the age comes back to about 300 years old. Now let's assume that this tree is historical because it was planted outside the Hungarian palace the day Leopold I, King of Hungary, died. Now it's known that he died in May of 1705, thus validating, independently of radioactive decay, that the tree is about 300 years old. Finally, let's take a look at dendrochronology or using tree rings to date it. This independent method arrives at the tree being 294 to 295 years old, thus validating, yet again, that the tree was planted in roughly 1705. The point that I'm trying to illustrate here is that with each independent method of data collection with a matching result, the higher the probability of accuracy becomes. The carbon dating and dendrochronology provide a higher probability of accuracy than the tree's historical significance alone. Now, let's move on to evolution. When assessing relatedness, there are certain diagnostic characteristics that organisms have. For the most part, these represent a major evolutionary breakthrough, a new toy that's never been seen before. For example, let's look at invertebrates and the diagnostic characteristic of true tissues. The only animals which lack them are sponges. All others have them. Next, we can look at the number of germ layers an organism have. Only cnidarians and tenophores, which are basically jellyfish, have two, and all others have three. Next, we can look at whether or not an organism has a body cavity. Tapeworms lack one, rotifers have a false, pseudocelum is the term, and all other organisms do have a true body cavity. Next, imagine sticking your thumb into a tennis ball. That's the shape of an early developing embryo, and the thumb indention is called a blastopore. In organisms like in insects, it forms the mouth. You will never ever find an insect where the blastopore forms the anus, or one without a coelom, or one with two germ layers, or one without true tissues. For starfish and vertebrates, the blastopore forms the anus. Now, this is a very complicated subject, but it's covered much more in depth in my video on embryology that I'm linking to in the video description. The point, however, is that we can use these different features, which are responsible for creating the unmistakable effects and forks in the tree of life, and construct an unambiguous history of life on Earth. Now, this tree-like pattern or descent with modification is a fingerprint of evolution, and it's only explainable by evolution. It's so reliable, in fact, that it's the basis of field guides. If you've ever wanted to identify a plant in the wild, you start by assessing the number and arrangements of leaves, flower presents, etc., until you arrive at the answer. Now, this method relies solely on the fact that all life shares a common ancestor, and each feature being identified represents a fork in the road of evolution, and following it correctly invariably leads to the correct answer. Now that we've seen how embryology points strongly to evolution, let's look at a completely different field, comparative anatomy. Now, evolution predicts that structures will change over time as life progresses. As such, we should expect to find specific similarities in the bodies of organisms which share a common ancestor. Now, it's very important to note that a similarity alone is not enough. We have to find a distinct pattern of similarities and differences where needed. After all, human and apes having very similar anatomical arrangements would mean absolutely nothing if they were cold-blooded, had genes for making feathers, or laid eggs. As such, it's not the similarities, it's the distinct pattern and location of those similarities, similarities and dif differences which is necessary for them to mean anything. So, for example, let's take a look at the vertebrate limb. Which of these limbs is not like the other? How do you know that? Now, notice that these tetrapod limbs are all similar to one another, because they're all built from many individual bones, and they're all spin-offs of the same basic design. You've got one long bone, the humerus, attached to two other long bones, the radius and the ulna, with a branching series of smaller bones on the end. From this data, we can connect, or we can construct a phylogenetic tree, which, after all, is a fingerprint of evolution, and test it. Now let's look at one such tree. Here we have a common ancestor and some of the organisms descending from it. Let's go one step further, though. What would we predict to find if evolution is true? We know the beginning and the end, so if evolution is true, when we look at the organisms in the middle, we should find these bones in the process of changing. A quick glance at the jaws and ears of reptiles and mammals will show you that they're very different. From embryology, it's undisputed that we know that in reptiles, the quadrate and articular bones develop into two bones in the lower jaw, while in mammals, they develop into two bones in the middle ear. Interestingly enough, the reptilian middle ear only has one bone, while the mammalian middle ear has three. So if evolution is true, what must have happened is that the quadrate and articular bones in the reptilian jaws were changed and readapted to form the two additional bones in the mammalian middle ear. But how can evolution confirm this? 
again by looking at the fossils of the organisms in between the start and end points. When we do this, we find the precise changes needed to confirm evolution. That is, we see the quadrate and articular bones of the reptilian jaw being pulled back and modified for function in the middle ear. Now, amusingly enough, it, it's not just one fossil in between that shows these changes. There are dozens demonstrating this precise change in the perfect sequence needed. Furthermore, when you actually go back and date the fossils, they are all in the perfect age. Now, by starting with these basal characteristics and working our way accordingly to life as we see today, we can clearly see that these structures are subtly changing over time, and can, in fact, be used to construct a phylogenetic tree based solely on the data from comparative anatomy. In fact, not only can this be done for an organism as a whole, it can be done for any single bone in the body, or any nerve, any vein, any artery, cartilage, muscle, or tendon for that matter. As such, the number of trees that we can make from organisms um, and their anatomical configurations are virtually limitless. Now perhaps you can see why evolution is called the unifying theory of biology, because we've just taken comparative anatomy and the jawbone of a reptile, and we've confirmed it and related it to both the fossil record and embryology. Now let's take a look at the fossil record. If evolution is correct, we would expect to see life progressing from simple to more complex as time goes on. We can predict that we will never find a complex mammal lying next to trilobites, we will never find a human being with or before dinosaurs, and we'll never see a poodle from the Permian era. So when we actually look at the fossil record, we find just that. There's a clear pattern of common descent attributable only to evolution. From the fossils and their relative ages alone, we can construct a phylogenetic tree based solely on the fossil record. And as a matter of fact, not only do we have that for the fossils in general, but we can do this for specific traits. Such analysis is dependent on transitional fossils to show how these features are being modified and changing over time. So please note before you parrot the old creationist lie that there are no transitional fossils, I have a transitional fossil playlist where dozens are discussed in depth. At this point, ignorance is no longer an excuse. I just demonstrated one example with the reptilian and mammalian middle ear, but are there more? And more importantly, do they yield the same results? This next example will provide and demonstrate the amazing pr predictive power of evolution. So we know from c comparative anatomy and embryology and genetics and the fossil record that the tetrapods creatures with four legs, arose from lobe-finned fishes. Now, from the fossils, we can predict, or we, we find that there are no tetrapod vertebrates 390 million years ago, but they are clearly there 360 million years ago. So as such, we can predict that we will find the transition from lobe-finned fishes to tetrapods somewhere in that 30 million year gap. Armed with this information, Neil Shubin and his colleagues looked at maps of exposed freshwater sediments which were about 375 million years ago. They formed an expedition and after five years of searching, found the needed transitional fossil, Tiktaalik. Now, Tiktaalik has gills, scales, and fins. It clearly lived in the water. But more importantly though, it has eyes and nostrils on the top rather than the sides of its skull, enabling it to peer above the water. It also had robust fins allowing it to push itself above the water and look around. Additionally, these fins have the precise arrangement of bones predicted by comparative anatomy. These appendages are best described as half fin, half leg. But even more interestingly though, Tiktaalik has sturdy ribs for pumping air and a neck. Fish do not have necks. In them, their skull joins directly to their shoulders. So as such, using the tools from the fossil record and comparative anatomy, researchers can go to a price loca or precise location in the world and find a transitional fossil with the exact features that evolution predicts. Creationism simply can't explain this. And, once again, using these fossils and the fossil record as a whole, we can construct a phylogenetic tree. Let's take a quick look at genetics and molecular biology. Can we construct phylogenetic trees from these fields? And the answer is a resounding yes. From genetics alone, we can look at organisms' DNA and see precisely how it has changed over time. Every gene of every organism on Earth can be analyzed and assessed for phylogeny. When we do this, we find that not only do we find the same tree pattern fingerprint of evolution, but that all of those trees are the same. The same goes for molecular biology. Every molecule synthesized in your body can have its history traced and a tree constructed for it. In fact, using molecular biology and genetics, we've even traced the evolutionary history of snake venom, something we couldn't do if evolution was incorrect. Not only are phylogenetic trees constructible for every branch of biology, but there are additional little biological quirks that can be used to construct them as well. Endogenous retroviruses, or ERVs, are one such thing. Basically, sometimes a virus inserts into an egg or a sperm and remains inactive, but its genes are still there. It can insert at random, so the odds of two unrelated organisms having the same viral DNA at the same location is simply unimaginably small. Think of it as dropping uh, two needles from space and having them land on a football field in the same molecule of dirt. Now, if, however, these two organisms share a common ancestor, their DNA will of course show the same viral DNA at the same location. 
when we look at our genome, we find not one, but dozens of these endogenous retroviruses in the same location, and phylogenetic trees can be constructed from them alone. So, as I've shown, phylogenetic trees best explain the meat of every field of biology. This is only explainable by evolution, but that's not the real reason that scientists accept it. Science takes it one step further and accepts evolution as the only possible solution because all of the trees from every independent field of biology line up and match one another. They are the same tree, using different methods to confirm its accuracy. Remember the age of the tree planted in the beginning of the video? Most reasonable people will accept the age with just three independent points of verification. With evolution, there are literally millions of data points along all of those independently formed trees, and the trees line up seamlessly. This is why every rational, informed person must accept evolution.